Hello, Mark here. Before we begin today's episode, I would just like to quickly take the time to ask all of those who are enjoying the series a favour. If the platform you use to listen to Castings for Ancient Greece has a rating or review system, I would be extremely grateful if you would consider leaving the series a quick review. These ratings and reviews go a long way into helping others discover the show, in turn helping it grow. So if you enjoy the series and can spare a few minutes, I would love to read what you have to say about your experiences with the show. Thanks everyone for your support, and let's get to today's episode. First place belonged to the Athenians, who had advanced so far in both fame and prowess that their name was known throughout particularly the entire inhabited world. For they increased their leadership to such a degree that by their own resources and without the aid of the Lacedaemonians or Peloponnesians, they overcame great Persian armaments, both on land and on sea, and humbled the famed leadership of the Persians to such an extent that they forced them by terms of a treaty to liberate all the cities of Asia. Diodorus Siculus. Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Castings for Ancient Greece, Episode 62, Crisis in the Aegean. In the last couple of episodes, we have seen Athens exert its influence throughout the Greek mainland. This period had initially gotten off to a shaky start, where Athens challenged Sparta, who was campaigning north of Attica in Boeotia. This had seen the Battle of Tanagra fought, with Sparta being the victors. Though fortunately for Athens, the defeat was not decisive, and it hurt both sides equally this seeing Sparta not in a position to dictate terms or follow up their victory. Athens was able to recover quickly and would launch a new series of campaigns just two months after Tanagra. The initial land campaign would focus on the region of Boeotia, where it had appeared Thebes, with an agreement with Sparta, may have been campaigning to bring the region together under Theban leadership. Athens would now disrupt whatever had been unfolding previously, and not only that, but would control much of the lands themselves. A naval campaign had also been launched, this looking to secure control over trade routes west in the Gulf of Corinth. Athens would focus on a number of strategic points that would also see them be able to disrupt their enemy's supply lines. Although the naval campaign seemed to focus on Sparta's allies, raids on the southern Peloponnese would also take place against Spartan targets. The goal of these seems to have been psychological, showing Sparta they had not been defeated, and highlighting how much more powerful their navy was. These two areas of campaigning would seem to continue on for a couple of years, where Athenian influence would grow throughout the Gulf. While the lands of Boeotia would see themselves under Athenian control, Athens would attempt to continue the spread of influence further north, but would find extending into Thessaly would just be out of reach for their already stretched resources. However, other matters would also see Athens stop their campaigning on the mainland. Some disastrous news would arrive, seeing their priorities change. Over in the Persian Empire, Xerxes had been assassinated in 465 BC, seeing his son Artaxerxes come to the throne. This transfer in power also saw Egypt once again try and break away from Persian control and revolt. The rebels were led by a Libyan king named Anaros, who would try and rally others to his cause. Athens would be approached for assistance around 460 BC, with them seeing economic advantages in Egyptian lands. Athens would end up sending a force of 200 ships to the Nile that would join with the rebels. The initial battle of the campaign would prove promising, and play out like most past engagements with the Persians. Though the surviving Persian forces would fall back to Memphis and behind the defences of the White Fortress. The defenders would be able to hold off the Athenians and rebels for quite some time, giving time for Artaxerxes to assemble a new army to march into Egypt. He would also attempt to defeat the Athenians through other means, though he would fail to convince Sparta to invade Attica. After nearly two years of preparation, a new Persian army would head into Egypt where they would surprise the Athenians and the rebels, defeating them in battle. This would see them scatter throughout the Nile Delta, the Athenians finding refuge on an island formed by the many tributaries. At this stage, much of the rebel force would surrender, along with their leader Anaros, this seeing the Persians being able to focus on the Athenian position. The water separating the two armies proved to be a defensive advantage to the Athenians, so the Persians would divert the waterways around the island, seeing it become connected to the rest of the land around it. Overwhelming Persian forces would now overcome the Athenian position, seeing much of the army destroyed. However, this was not the end of the disaster, as a reinforcing fleet had been dispatched to come to the aid of the besieged Athenians. Unfortunately for them, they had not learned to the destruction of the force they were coming to the aid of. This fleet would be ambushed and also destroyed as they entered the Nile. 
For this episode, we are going to focus on what would follow on from the successful campaigns that had occurred in Greek lands. Though this would also be the point where it was clear that a great disaster had occurred in Egypt, seeing many Athenian fighting men and ships lost. The policy behind the past five years or so of expanding influence in Greek lands would now be revisited. The losses in Egypt, along with the possible Persian retaliations, would see Athens needing to direct their now even further stretched forces to protect Athenian power. Also added to these headaches was the perceived weakness a number of Delian League members would view Athens to be in. This would also see resources needing to be used in maintaining the integrity of the League that had brought Athens all of its newfound influence. The year 454 BC would be a turning point in Athenian policy on the Greek mainland with the disaster they experienced in Egypt. The current policy had seen an aggressive approach taken to challenge Spartan influence, which in turn saw Athenians gain more influence in Greek lands. Now though, priorities would change and Athens needed to preserve its newfound power. This had seen a truce now exist between Athens and Sparta, though this would also affect other city-states that had been connected to them through this period. As I pointed out last episode, we are unaware of what the peace arrangements between Sparta and Athens entailed. However, Thucydides tells us that Athens had freed themselves of any Hellenic war during this period. In the absence of any other details, historians have made educated guesses on what other terms may have been likely. Donald Kagan in his work, The Outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, puts forward the idea that one of the central points around this agreement, abandoning their most threatening allies. For Athens, this would mean abandoning Argos, who geographically and historically posed the greatest threat to Sparta and their surrounding regions. For Sparta, they would have had to break ties with Thebes, who as we have seen had designs on uniting Boeotia under their leadership. Without Sparta to back them up, Athens could focus on disrupting this and exerting their own influence into Boeotia without worrying about Spartan influence. For the most part, we would see campaigning activities calm down on the Greek mainland. Around the Peloponnese and the Gulf of Corinth, it appears Athens sought to just maintaining the position they had created themselves. They would have not wanted to involve themselves in any sort of ongoing campaign, as their attention and resources were needed elsewhere. Perhaps even part of the truce with Sparta might have had a clause on targeting their allies on the Peloponnese. This I think could have been plausible, as the campaigns that had been unfolding would have seen diplomatic pressure placed on Sparta from their allies. If Sparta failed to do anything, it could very well see members leave the League and even favour Athens, opening more areas of the Peloponnese Athens could take advantage of. It also appears in the lull of this campaign that Corinth was wary of directly targeting Athens in the region, due to Sparta effectively now being on the sidelines. Though, as we will see with the approach of the Peloponnesian War, Corinth would develop some bitter hatred towards Athens, due to Athens' gains at Corinth's expense during this time. Within Boeotia, it also seemed campaigning had come to an end, though unlike on the Peloponnese, it does appear some level of operation was still taking place. As we saw, Athens had marched in and defeated Theban and other Boeotian troops in a decisive engagement, this then opening the way for Athens to control many areas of Boeotia. However, after this point, sources were pretty quiet on what was taking place there. We do though get a hint that Athens had not gained complete control, with perhaps some areas not being pacified. This had come through in Diodorus's account when he tells us Pericles had taken over campaigning in the Corinthian Gulf, due to the previous general in the region, Ptolemides, now occupied in Boeotia. This phrase is not elaborated on, but given that we are told of other campaigns in the Gulf and in Thessaly, it appears Ptolemides was involved in the unglamorous duties of an occupying force. It would then appear that these sorts of operations at Boeotia would continue over the next few years. Sparta was not going to involve themselves during the period of the truce, but some regions within Boeotia were still resisting Athenian influence. However, we will revisit the situation in Boeotia next episode towards the end of the Five Years' Truce, where things start to heat up for Athens. One region we would now see Athens become more active in would be the Aegean. The consequences of the defeat in Egypt would now see Athens having to divert their attention eastward. This was the area that Athens initially gained influence in after the defeat of the Persian invasions, and would form the foundation of their growth and power. One area we would see Athens need to turn their attention was maintaining the integrity of the Delian League. It appears that the news of things not going well in Egypt for Athens and the League had spread throughout the Aegean. This would see some of the League's members view Athens in a weakened state and preoccupied. The two members that have been seen to have revolted in the late 450s were both on the coast of Anatolia. 
This perhaps also seeing Persian intrigue playing some part in the decision to attempt to break away. Now, our ancient sources do not relay these rebellions, but we are aware of them through other means. In the case of the polis of Othria, we are aware of their revolt due to an now lost decree that was copied. This decree, thought to be dated to 452 BC, outlined the measures imposed on the city after having been brought back into the league by force. It appears the revolt had been led by a tyrant that had Persian backing. Though once the rebellion was defeated, a democracy was implemented under Athenian supervision, with them also manning a garrison within the city. The other polis that we are aware of revolting was that of Miletus, though our knowledge of their rebellion comes through the absence of information. This has to do with what is known as the Athenian tribute list, which we first seen being recorded in 454 BC. These lists were the Athenians' records of the amount of tribute each Delian League member provided. Miletus, known to be a Delian League member, was absent from the first two tribute lists, though would appear on the 452 BC tribute list, suggesting the city had been brought back under control around the same time as Erythea. We are not aware of the terms imposed, though it does appear that there was some form of Athenian political supervision. Speaking of the Athenian tribute lists, these were tied to the treasury of the Delian League. And here we would see a big shift in the nature of the League and Athens' control over it. As we had seen, the League's treasury had been kept on the island of Delos, hence the name of the League. Though in 454 BC, with events unfolding as they were, Athens would see to it that the League's treasury would be moved to Athens. This was quite a significant shift, as the location of the treasury was seen to show it was not owned by any one polis, but was the possession of the League. Now though, this would almost leave no doubt to all the members who was really in control of the League. We had been seeing how Athens was gradually exerting more influence within the League as the years passed, but now they would have a monopoly on the League's funds and use it as they saw fit. It's also worth pointing out that this event of the Treasury being moved to Athens in 454 is also seen as a point of the Delian League turning into the Athenian Empire, though in reality this was an evolving process and we will see a couple of other changes that would see this even further reinforced. So I guess a good question here is why did Athens move the treasury within their own city? Well this would be seen to be tied up in the disaster that took place in Egypt. Though what is difficult to know for sure is if this provided reason and was purely reacting to events for the move, or had this just provided a pretext for an action that was already part of Athenian calculations. The reasoning for this move would have been cited as the Aegean not being as secure as it previously had been. With the loss of the League's navy in Egypt, there were less resources to deal with any future Persian incursion around the Greek islands. Historically, when the Greeks were seen to have become involved in Persian matters, like with the Ionian Revolt, the Persians had reacted with force, this leading to the Persian invasions. To the Greeks this was now a very real possibility after this disaster in Egypt. Another reason that perhaps would have not been publicly talked about might have to do with the increased occurrences of League members revolting or providing some sort of resistance to how Athens was running the League. Athens may have viewed the treasury less secure where it was, with the discontent that had been developing with its own members. Though what we do know is that Athens would take advantage of the treasury now being located in Athens very quickly. The tribute lists that were generated starting in the same year were actually recording the amount of tribute from each member the Athenians would take for the use of Athens itself. We will touch on this point again towards the end of the episode. This recorded 1 60th of the full tribute each member provided therefore allowing us to see what the tribute each member paid in full each year. Other measures were also taken to help secure the situation with the Delian League, or if you prefer, the Athenian Empire. These would be in the form of colonies and an official known as the Proxenoi. These colonies Athens would establish within the territories of its empire. Their main function was to maintain and control the vast areas controlled by Athens, with these colonies providing garrisons. The Proxenoi were an official that built relations with the various members and oversaw the tribute collected from each member state. So with these measures and actions that were being implemented since the Egyptian disaster, Athens was gradually gaining back control over the shaky elements of the League. This would see the ability to defend Greek territories in better shape than it had been before. However, there was still the threat that Persia might invade again. Athens was not going to wait to see this develop and would now move to take the initiative. Athens would now focus on checking any Persian advances in the Aegean, with them turning to one place that had seen both Greeks and Persians looking to further their influence, that of Cyprus. 
In essence, Pericles was now overseeing an Athens that had returned to a policy that had reigned supreme under Chimon. It was also the newly returned Chimon who would lead the aggressive move against Persia. 200 ships would be dispatched to sail for Cyprus, which had retained its Persian influence, with 60 being detached to make for Egypt to assist the king of the marshes, Emiratus. Remembering back to our episode, Disaster on the Nile, Emiratus had held out after Anaros surrendered, and four years on was still defying the Persians. The remaining 120 ships under Chimon's command then made for the city of Citium on the southern coast of Cyprus. Here they would lay siege to the city, and at some stage during it, we hear that Chimon would die of either wounds or a sickness. His death, as well as the Athenian force being very low on supplies, would see Athos decide to abandon the siege. Though, apparently Chimon had instructed his generals to quit the siege while he was on his deathbed and keep his death a secret from the army. The Greeks had quit the siege, but had continued on Cyprus, where we would hear, a month later, they would be attacked on land and sea, at the southeastern city of Salamis, by Cilicians, Phoenicians, and Cyprians. In both the engagements on land and sea, the Greek forces would be victorious, and would then prepare themselves to sail back to Greece. On their return journey, they would link back up with the fleet that was active in Egypt, and would return to Athens. This is where Thucydides leaves matters, with us not even sure of the activities that took place in Egypt. However, they must have been more successful than four years earlier, since the fleet did return. Though it appears Amaratus' situation in the Western Nile Delta remained somewhat unchanged. Now though, if we turn to Diodorus, we would find an event that would result from the campaigns in Cyprus and Egypt. This would be known as the Peace of Callias, effectively seeing a formalised treaty between Athens and Persia. Though the existence of this treaty is controversial, not only in our times, but the ancients also questioned it. If you have been enjoying the series and thinking of supporting the show, why not head over to the Casting Through Ancient Greece Patreon page. Over there you can extend monthly support to the show, where to show my appreciation, I provide members with early access ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and video series updates, where we run competitions for members. There are also options available that allow members access to fully referenced show scripts, as well as a personal forum where questions are answered monthly via video. By far and away, the most popular supporter tier is the Strategos level, where access to the bonus episodes opens up. In these bonus episodes, we head back to the beginning of the series and explore certain aspects in more detail. Members can also influence what they would like to see covered in these episodes. Currently, we have just finished exploring the Spartan figure of Lycurgus and the Athenian Solon. We will now be turning our attention to some of the early institutions that would define both Sparta and Athens, with us first turning to the Spartan education system of the Agoge. So, if this sounds like something you would be interested in gaining access to, please consider heading to Patreon and supporting the series there. Alternatively, you can visit the Casting Through Ancient Greece website, where you can find other ways to support the show by clicking on the Support the Series button. Thanks everyone for listening to the series, and I hope you're enjoying the journey. So, first things first. This piece, known as the Peace of Callias, was named after an Athenian figure of Callias, who we had met previously in passing. Callias was an extremely wealthy Athenian noble, who we saw help Chimon pay off the debt of his father Miltiades. This would then clear the path for Chimon to generate wealth and become an influential figure in politics. Though Chimon, in exchange for this assistance, had given the hand of his sister in marriage to Callias. After this period, the only glimpses of Callias that we see are when he is in the role of a diplomat, and that is exactly the role he is fulfilling within the Peace of Callias. Anyway, let's look at what Diodorus reports on the peace, and then we will look into the question of if it really existed. Artaxerxes the king, however, when he learnt of the reverses his forces had suffered in Cyprus, took counsel on the war with his friends, and decided that it was to his advantage to conclude a peace with the Greeks. Accordingly, he dispatched to the generals in Cyprus, and to the satraps, written terms on which they are permitted to come to a settlement with the Greeks. Consequently, Artabazus and Megabazos sent ambassadors to Athens to discuss the settlement. The Athenians were favourable and dispatched ambassadors, the leader of whom was Callias, the son of Hippogonus. And so the Athenians and their allies concluded with the Persians a treaty of peace. The principal terms of which run as follows. All the Greek cities of Asia, 
are to live under the laws of their own making. The satraps of the Persians are not to come nearer to the sea than three days' journey. And no Persian warship is to sail inside the Pharsalus or Cyanian rocks. And if these terms are observed by the king and his generals, the Athenians are not to send troops into the territory over which the king is ruler. After the treaty had been solemnly concluded, the Athenians withdrew their armaments from Cyprus, having won a brilliant victory and concluded the most noteworthy terms of peace. So, here we see it was the fighting around Cyprus that saw Artaxerxes wanted to come to an agreement. During his father's time, Persia had suffered defeat after defeat, round the Aegean and in Anatolia. However, one of Artaxerxes' first experiences as king with the Greeks was crushing them in the Egyptian revolt. Though it appears a great deal of Persian resources were called upon to do this. Now though, he had seen the Athenians were far from weak, and now continued their success in battle against the Persians and their allies. Artaxerxes was now also probably looking to stabilise his borders in the Mediterranean, to allow him to use his resources elsewhere. This supported in the terms on Athens, where they were to leave Persian controlled lands alone, this including Cyprus. Athens in turn, in the agreement, would also secure its areas of influence that bordered Persian territory, that would then allow them to begin focusing on developments closer to home. The main term seeing the Greek cities in Anatolia shielded from Persian influence, therefore keeping them as full tribute paying members of the Delian League, or perhaps the Athenian Empire by now. Though as I have said, it is still debated if this peace of Callias actually existed. Our only historian that specifically outlines the peace of Callias is that of Diodorus. However, Plutarch also speaks of a peace in the wake of a victory over the Persians at the Eurymedon some 15 years earlier, though he also points out that there was doubt over its existence. Though this peace is not named, and as we have seen, Athens had not left Persian territory alone afterwards. In ancient times, the historian Theopompus, writing during the 4th century, would call the agreement of the Peace of Callias a fabrication, citing that the lettering used to record it had not come into use by the time of the peace. However, this in itself doesn't disprove its existence, as we know of other instances where original documents have been copied later to preserve them though we need to acknowledge that this can lead to changes from the original occurring. While we also get from Herodotus some information in passing that suggests it could have taken place, he is focusing on Argos just before Xerxes' invasion and the friendship they agreed to. Then he talks of a period of years later where diplomats from Argos travelled to Susa to reconfirm their friendship and supposedly while they were there, Callias was also in Susa on some other business. What business, we don't know. But in a period where we are given incomplete and hazy accounts, it points to the possibility of this peace being arranged at this time. Though, given the inconsistent accounts around the peace and another big factor, Thucydides fails to mention anything of it, debate has continued to exist if this was a formalised treaty, effectively ending the Greek and Persian War. However, even if the peace of Callias was not a formalised agreement between Athens and Persia, it seems a campaign launched against Cyprus and Egypt in 450 would stabilise the Aegean for Athens when it came to Persian activities. We are unsure of what unfolded in Egypt, but we have seen that Cyprus remained under Persian control. Though around Cyprus, Athens had shown that they had not lost their fighting ability and were formidable opponents still. This would have made Artaxerxes think again about arranging any renewed effort against Greece. And in the aftermath of the Cyprian campaign, operations between Athenian and Persian forces dry up dramatically. With the immediate crises of revolting League members, though these wouldn't be the last, and securing the borders between Athenian and Persian territory interests, Pericles was now looking to make this the status quo. He was also looking to maintain the truce that had existed with Sparta and turn it into something more permanent. Cimon had been able to secure the truce through his favourable relations with Sparta, well at least the peace party there anyway. Though he was now gone and Pericles was now dominating Athenian politics, and would have this challenge ahead of him, remembering he had been involved in the faction that sought to operate aggressively towards Sparta. Now though, it seems he had recognised through some of Athens' setbacks that the polis had reached its potential territorially for now, without stretching its resources too thin, to where it would risk bringing down the power and influence that had been built. However, surely one condition Sparta would be looking to impose on Athens for a longer lasting peace would be for Athens to give up its control around Megara. As we have seen, control and access through the Corinthian Isthmus was an important matter for both cities. Control in the region not only allowed for influence to be imposed on those relying on this land route, 
but it also provided security, whether in the form of defensive or offensive manoeuvres. Though this would be a huge ask on Athens, and for the sake of their security from threats from the Peloponnese, an almost impossible concession to make. Anyway, Pericles would now work on attempting to shore up its relations and stability with Sparta, its league members, and other Greeks. This would come in the form of a bill that would be introduced, which Plutarch relays to us. The bill was to invite all Greeks, wherever they lived, whether in Europe or in Asia, whether small cities or large, to send representatives to a congress at Athens, to deliberate about holy places that the barbarian had destroyed, and about the sacrifices that they owed, having promised them to the gods when they had fought against the barbarians, and about the sea so that they might all sail without fear and keep the peace. This bill would pass and Athens would send out 20 men, who we are told were over 50 years in age, this supposedly representing the maturity and dignity of what was trying to be achieved. They would depart for the various parts of the Greek world and deliver this message. Five to the eastern Aegean and Anatolia, five to Thrace and the Hellespont up to Byzantium, five to Boeotia, Phocis, Acania, Abrasia and the Peloponnese, while the last five would travel to Euboea, the islands nearby and to Thessaly. The main objective of the Congress that these messengers delivered to the Greek world would be to come to take part in the debates for settling the peace and jointly regulating the affairs of Greece. This bill and the actions taken by Athens to see it delivered to the wider Greek world would come across as a grand idea and undertaking. However, in reality, it would not eventuate, coming across as an anticlimax in what appears to be a build-up of potential panhellenism not held together by war or an outside threat. Plutarch tells us he presented this effort the way he did, to highlight the spirit of the man, that being Pericles, and the greatness of his thoughts. However, some have seen that due to this point that Pericles seems to be wanting to project, coupled with what would be required to make a lasting peace, that he was disingenuous in his attempt. They ask what did he really think Sparta's response would be to such a proposal after the manoeuvrings that had gone on the previous years. Athens had inserted themselves into areas of Spartan influence and Sparta could not accept these to remain. Therefore, surely a Spartan refusal would be expected allowing Athens to claim what they had by default. But there are those who look favourably on Pericles in this attempt. What is pointed to here showing he was genuine in his search for a lasting peace in the Greek world was first the vast effort and scale Athens went to to try and bring so many of the Greek cities together. Next, Chiron's recall and cooperation with Pericles and the subsequent agreement to the five years truce points to the initial stages of attempting to repair relations for further talks for peace to take place. What the intentions of Pericles were some 2,500 years ago, based off what survives in the sources, is going to be hard to know for sure. But the historian Donald Kagan points out that the reality was, whichever way Sparta went, Athens would win out in some way. If the Peace Party in Sparta had still held a good amount of influence in Spartan politics, they may have also seen Pericles in a more favourable light, given his cooperation with Chiron and Sparta's dealings with Chiron during this period. So if Pericles had all good intentions with this bill in regards to Sparta and saw something could be potentially worked out, it would have Pericles pull off a diplomatic triumph. If both of these biggest Greek powers were working towards this idea of Panhellenism, then many of their allies and smaller states would have followed. Though, on the other hand, if Sparta refused to cooperate, this being what many see as being Sparta's most realistic option, which feeds back into the disingenuous argument, then Athens would have lost nothing but gained much. Athens had basically broadcasted to the entire Greek world its intention of advancing Panhellenism and peace amongst all Greeks. This in the face of Spartan refusal to cooperate would see the moral advantage lay with Athens in the eyes of many. As we will see next episode, the failure to see this Congress realised, and more importantly, Sparta's part in that, would see the resolution to the First Peloponnesian War not come about just yet. A state of truce existed between Sparta and Athens, but it was to last only five years. Added to this, the truce only applied to the interaction between these two powers. There were others who looked upon Athens with hostile intent. Though, to finish out this episode, I think we'll turn to looking at Athens and its relationship with the Delian League, or perhaps, more increasingly, its empire, after the Peace of Callias had reportedly taken place.
So now it appears that Pericles had put a stop to the Athenian expansionist aims. It was time to consolidate and strengthen what they had possessed. This made a lot of sense, as Athens had accumulated a lot of power and influence in the past generation, but had also shown how it could all be potentially lost in a major miscalculation. If Athens shifted their focus to ensuring the interests and possessions of the city were well maintained, it could provide a stronger foundation and make Athens more resilient in times of trouble. As we will see, Athens would still have to deal with those looking to leave the league, but they were putting measures in place to try and make this even more difficult. One big hurdle that had to be overcome came in the wake of the Peace of Callias, if this was in fact an official treaty, as it would signify that the conflict with Persia had come to an end. If members had been questioning their membership previous to this, what would stop them now from attempting to leave now that peace had been made with the reason of the league's existence in the first place? Well, Athens had been learning from their past experiences and would implement various different measures to maintain the League's integrity. A moral argument had been put forward when Pericles drafted his bill that was communicated to the Greek world. This stressed the idea of Panhellenism. Although it had failed to see a Congress form, it did highlight the importance of a unified Greece resting on common ideals. This unity would be important for the collective security while also providing more opportunities for development economically and culturally. We would also see elements of coercion through oversight used to provide more security to the internal workings of the League. This, as we have mentioned, was in the form of the League's treasury being moved from Delos to Athens. While we also saw Athens establish garrison-type colonies in various regions around the League members. Added to this element was also the Athenian officials assigned to these regions that were responsible for maintaining relations with the League members, ensuring they were providing the required tribute. This would see that Athens had eyes and ears on the ground in many of these areas, where the attitudes of the various members could be better gauged. Athens would also take steps to standardise all the League's members economically. Athens would see to it that the League members would stop producing their own coinage, and would instead adopt Athenian coins. In addition to this, the weights and measures that were used by Athens would be implemented in all of the member cities. This would see that trade and commerce between all the League members would be much more streamlined, while the currency use would be far more secure, since all were using the same standard. Though another element here would see that it would make it much more difficult for a member to break away, as this would tend to hurt them more economically, since they were tied to the Athenian system. However, even with all this taking place, not everyone would stay happy with the situation. We would even find Athens would take actions that would be counterproductive to maintaining cohesion. While, as we will see in the future, even with the treaty in place, Persia would use other means to try and undermine Athens' influence on the edges of its empire. One can imagine that the removal of the treasury to Athens would have seen many of the members become nervous and suspicious. However, steps were still taken to show that the funds were going into maintaining a fleet that was able to protect the league within the Aegean. Though, through a decree that has been reconstructed from a badly damaged papyrus, we can see what appears to be the beginnings of a new practice for Athens moving forward. This decree appears to be part of a commentary on speeches recorded during the time of Demosthenes, nearly a hundred years later, though the part we are interested in relates to the decree Pericles made in 449 BC. The appropriate officials are to carry up to the Panathenia for Athens the money lying in the public treasury which has been collected from the cities, a sum of 5,000 talents, according to Aristides' assessment, and to take up to the Acropolis after that a further 3,000 during the period of construction. And in order to maintain control of the sea, the council to care for the old triremes so as to hand them over sound and to build new ones in addition each year besides those already on hand to the number of 10. As we see here, this decree stresses the maintenance and construction of new triremes to be used in the League's fleet, but the new element we see now creeping in is the use of the treasury for Athens' own use. This would see the great building program initiated by Pericles that would transform the Acropolis into the reconstructions that we are familiar with today. Surely over time, the member cities would have caught on what was being done with some of the money, though with the various changes within the League, they were probably not in a position to do anything about it. We will also find as we move on in the series that there would be debate within Athens around this debated misuse of League funds. Anyway, I think we will leave these developments with the League here for now. As events continue to unfold, 
we will see further developments within the league continue. So as we have seen, Athens, in the wake of the Egyptian disaster, had to rein in the expansionist policy it had been pursuing. Pericles had recognised that Athens was now overextended, and would now have a tough time dealing with Sparta, defending any further Persian incursions, and maintaining the league. This saw a temporary truce come about with Sparta, seeing campaigning on the mainland quietened down. This now allowed for the potential crises developing in the Aegean to be focused on. This would see the focus of the Athenian military power being directed on Cyprus, an area of important influence for the Persians. Although the island would remain under Persian control, the battles that took place would seem to motivate Artaxerxes in coming to some sort of peace arrangement with Athens. This coming down to us in the sources as being known as the Peace of Callias. With the Persian threat of invasion curtailed for the time being, Athens was then able to focus on securing the integrity of the Delian League, or what could now be described as becoming the Athenian Empire. The Egyptian defeat had seen some look to break away, though Athens far from weak was able to force them back in. They would then shift to implementing measures to stabilise the League that saw oversight and coercion featured heavily. However, with these changes, Athens' policy had now shifted from expanding to now maintaining the empire it had carved out for itself. One large change making this shift was the relocation of the treasury from Delos to Athens. While Pericles would also see it acceptable with Athens being able to use a proportion of the funds for Athens' direct benefit. So, for now, it appeared that the crisis in the Aegean had been avoided, but the First Peloponnesian War had still not been resolved. A temporary peace had only seen it lay dormant. Next episode, we're going to turn to the final years of the war and then look to the peace that would follow it. First, we will turn to look at Sparta during the period of the Five Years' Truce and what it appears that they were up to during this period. Then, towards the end of the truce, we would see the Spartans once again become active and engage in what would be called the Second Sacred War around Delphi. The results of this war would eventually see Athens respond with their own campaign though not directly against Sparta yet. Not long after this, the situation in Boeotia would change for Athens, putting them on the back foot in the region. A decisive battle would be fought against the Boeotian army that would turn out to be a disaster for the Athenians. This would have wider ramifications, with more League members looking to leave in a period of what appears to be Athenian weakness. More pressures would then be placed on Athens, with a five-year truce coming to an end. Sparta, it appears, had intentions of campaigning when it had run its course and would now invade Attica, seeing Athens having to focus on defending its home region. Though direct confrontation would be avoided between Athens and Sparta this time around, and talks would end up leading to the creation of the Thirty Years' Peace, bringing an end to the First Peloponnesian War. Thank you everyone for your continued support, and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting it on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution is truly helping me grow the series. I would like to give a personal shout out to a couple of new members over on Patreon, so a huge thank you to Lee and Caleb Morton for deciding to sign up and support the series over there. If you have also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button, where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series, and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time when we continue the narrative in the series with episode 63, War's End. <laughs>